Perhaps the most remarkable thing about Buddhist monks in Thailand is that there are so many of them. Nobody quite knows the true number, but a reasonable estimate is 250,000. There is no Christian country with anything approaching that high proportion of men devoting their lives to religion. If we make a simple comparison with home, there are five times as many Buddhist monks in Thailand as there are Christian priests and religious in Ireland. The second remarkable thing about Buddhist monasticism is how easy it is to join the Sangha or monastery. Pretty well all you have to do is to shave your head, get a few bits and pieces together like robes and begging bowl, and present yourself for ordination. That, and make up your mind to keep the rules set by the Lord Buddha for his monks, which of course may not be so easy. As a Buddhist monk, one is expected to keep 227 precepts. These include abstaining from intoxicating liquor at all times, from eating at unseasonable times, which means any time after midday, abstaining from all sexual intercourse, abstaining from the use of high or broad beds, couches or seats, from receiving presents of gold and silver, raw grain and meat, women and maidens, slaves, cattle and elephants, abstaining from all buying and selling, from idle talk, from reading and hearing fabulous shows and tales, and so on. The prospect of all this self-deprivation, however, doesn't seem to worry Mr. Akathi as he clutches his begging bowl and strides purposefully from the ordination ceremony to take up residence in Wat Bawanavet, Bangkok. Wat Bawanavet is one of the major Wats or monasteries in Thailand. Its founder was a deputy king, and one of its earlier abbots later ruled Thailand for 14 and a half years as King Rama IV, Mongkut. My Buddhist catechism says that the object of the Sangha or community of monks is to enable the most virtuous, intelligent and spiritually minded persons to withdraw from surroundings where their selfish desires are naturally strengthened in order to devote their lives to the acquisition of the highest wisdom and to fit themselves to guide others out of the present path leading towards misery into the harder path that leads to true happiness and final liberation, nirvana. And just as there are different roads to Nirvana, so there are different kinds of Buddhist monasteries. Pradhamachando explains. Actually, I don't, I don't live here. I'm just staying here now. But uh, I usually stay in, in a place called Nongkai, which is on the Laos and Thai border. And it's quite different than here in that it's a meditation monastery where this is a, a study monastery. Uh, here they have the university and teachers in the university and the students go to university like uh, ordinary students. But in the forest monastery, we live uh, a meditative life where we have one teacher and he instructs us in meditation. And it's not a study program where you progress year by year, but uh, a meditation thing, which is a personal, a personal way of, of living. Clearly, Pradhamachando doesn't come from Thailand, but from the U.S. of A. Not directly, however, but via Wat Nanachat, which is a forest monastery near Uban on the Thai border with Laos, 400 miles from Bangkok. A forest monastery is what it says. There is a big clearing with a temple and guest house, and off deep in the forest, cells for the community of monks. I found Wat Nanichet a quiet place and beautiful, but at the same time, like all tropical forests, somewhat somber and even eerie. I could only marvel at what brought men from England, Australia and America to live together in such a remote part of Indochina. Sean is a novice at Wat Nanichet, 
I met him in Bangkok, where he was looking after one of his fellow monks who was seriously ill. What is your name, actually? Sean? Sean. Sean what? Sean's enough, I think. Sean's enough, yeah. Are you of Irish, Irish origin? No, no. No. Just, uh, my mother liked the name, I think. Ah, yes. Where do you come from? In England? Yes, my parents live uh, close to Cambridge in the east of England. How did you become interested in Buddhism? I think first reading was the thing that did it. I used to read a lot and uh, pick books up and just struck a note with me. And first, first he really books on Zen Buddhism. And this is something I think you find with a lot of Westerners who end up very seriously interested in Buddhism, reading a lot of books on Zen. It's uh, quite popular and fad in the West even. There's a lot um, of difference between reading about Zen and becoming a monk. I mean, how certainly. did that come about? Uh, I finished school and I had more or less a place guaranteed at university, but I wanted to go traveling first and I went to India and it was there um, I really came into contact with the more practical sides, uh, learning about meditation and what meditation was. Jeremy is also English, but came to the monastic life by a more casual route. Well, I, I finished my degree in England and uh, didn't have any idea about what kind of career I wanted to follow. So I thought I might as well go traveling. So um, about 15 months ago I arrived in Thailand and uh, I was uh, a bit fed up with traveling along the tourist route with all the other young travelers and uh, I was told that the Northeast was really quite, quite wild and quite uh, unvisited. So uh, I um, I was given the address of some doctors who work at a refugee camp in Ubon and um, I just turned up on their doorstep and introduced myself. And uh, I asked them about whether anything, was there anything interesting in the area? And they said, well, there's this monastery of Western monks about 10 miles out of town. So I thought, oh, sounds uh, worth a visit. So one Sunday afternoon I dropped by and uh, I've been here ever since. The abbot of Wat Nanachat used to be a soldier, known to his friends as Joe. Nowadays, one calls him Tan Papa Kiao. I first became interested when uh, I was in Vietnam, a soldier in Vietnam, and uh, I had a chance to come to Thailand and visit here, uh, just in Bangkok initially. And uh, my life at that time was uh, I was looking for something spiritual, something more meaningful in my life uh, for many reasons. And uh, one, of course, was being in combat and in a situation which uh, uh, was the cause for the arising of, of, of an inner search for something more meaningful and seeing the uh, foolish things that uh, human beings uh, get themselves involved in. So that uh, when I came to Thailand, I, uh, it was kind of like uh, putting on uh, an old pair of shoes. Everything was strange, of course, but something about it all kind of fit. And uh, I uh, just started seeking every uh, kind of book and information, uh, Western people that were already uh, in robes in Bangkok at that time, and getting as much information as I could uh, about Buddhism the teachings and the way of life, meditation and uh, everything. Before I come here, I had two professions. One, I, in the winter time, I worked as a massagist, masseur, is the right name in English? Massagist. And in the summertime, I, I was a cowboy in the, in the Austrian mountains on the Alps. Not, not for cows, for calves. calves. I hadn't the courage to explain to Koditek Berner from Austria what masochist meant in English. It might seem a little near to the bone. But why anyway had he come? It was uh, the suffering. It was uh, unsatisfied with, with my life, which leads me to, to search for a way out of the suffering. And then I heard about Buddhism and it's fascinated me. And since, since this time I, 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 I try to practice it. 
It was to seek an answer to the problem of human suffering that Prince Siddhartha Gautama left his wife and child, his father's kingdom and his family inheritance to seek understanding and enlightenment five centuries before Christ. The key to understanding came to him six years later, meditating under a Bodhi tree. At that moment, he became a Buddha, or enlightened one. In memory of that event, Wat Bhavan has a golden chedi or pagoda to house a relic of Siddhartha Gautama and a Bodhi tree grown from a sapling of the original sacred tree in India. The Buddha's first sermon contains the kernel of his teaching in four great truths. One, suffering is universal. Two, the cause of suffering is craving or selfish desire. Three, the cure for suffering is the elimination of craving. Four, the way to eliminate craving is to practice such virtues as lead to a life of good works and inner peace of mind. Prabhrama Wongo from London, England, told me what the life of virtue meant for him. We get up at three in the morning, and then we have uh, a chanting or group meditation at four o'clock, which usually goes on until just before dawn. Just before dawn, we uh, collectively tidy up the, the eating hall, and when it's tidied up, we go on our arms round for about an hour and a half, and then we come back and we uh, collect all our food together, and it's distributed evenly down the line of monks and novices. And then we eat it. And that will finish about 9 o'clock or 10 o'clock, which time then we return to our, our little huts. And usually from then until 3 in the afternoon, we are free to either do our own little projects or to sit or to rest or whatever. And at 3 we do our chores for about an hour or maybe longer, depending on how much there is to do. And then we uh, meet in the evening, usually about 7 o'clock, and we have a group sitting or group walking, perhaps some chanting, perhaps an evening drink, and uh, we dismiss about 9 or perhaps 9.30, and we go back and some people practice further, some people rest, it all depends on the person. The needs of a forest monk are simple, and a monk has time to meet most of them. Nearby villagers supply food, so there's no need to grow any. Water is available in plenty. Gas to heat the odd kettle is now produced on site, with dung from the monk's privy. This facility was designed by Pra Brahma Wongo, who is wise in such matters, having a physics degree from London University. Chores such as drawing water or sweeping the temple are carried out in silence and are seen not just as chores but as contributing to one's spiritual development. At Uban, the meditation teacher emphasizes that one must learn to use all aspects of daily life as one's meditation, not just the time set aside for formal practice. The abbot speaks of becoming mindful which means becoming aware, being alert, and attentive to the details of whatever one is doing, putting all one's energy into it, always reflecting and being aware of what is coming up within one's own heart and mind. This constant attention to what is going on within one's mind and heart in the midst of the daily chores is considered to be an important part of meditation. I asked the abbot whether he saw some parallels between Christian and Buddhist asceticism. Uh, I think the three basic uh, tenets of Christian monasticism, of uh, poverty, chastity, and obedience, uh, definitely apply to uh, Buddhist monastic tradition as well. Uh, as far as obedience, uh, it's very important learning to yield, be yielding, and surrender to uh, the way of life, to the uh, discipline. We have a very strict code of discipline that we have to keep. And, of course, humbling uh, oneself to uh, one's teacher and uh, all senior monks as far as that goes. But there's kind of a mutual 
uh, respect and understanding, uh, a kind of obedience that we have uh, in relating with each other, that we all have something to, to teach each other and not just the teacher teaching us, but of course we have something to teach him as well. To the casual visitor, Buddhist monks seem relatively peripatetic. The Buddha himself was, of course, an itinerant preacher, so there is a tradition behind some of this wandering. You'd have to ask permission, really, from the abbot or from the uh, head abbot Ajahn Chah if you really wanted to go away for some time. If there was a good reason, then he'd let you go. If there wasn't a good reason, then he wouldn't let you go. You have, therefore, fairly strict obedience to the abbot. Right, but it's like purely voluntary. If you don't want to um, accept the authority of the Ajahn, then you, you can go as you like. Whatever about longer absences, the monk has to leave his monastery every day to collect food or he would starve. He is not allowed to grow food or to buy it. It must be given to him. He is not even allowed to say thank you to his benefactors because they gain merit by giving to him and he is only providing them with an opportunity to benefit themselves. This tradition, however, is much criticized by those unsympathetic to Buddhist monasticism. Monks are parasitic, they say, and contribute nothing useful to the wider community. I put the objection to Brad Damachando for comment. Actually, uh, the teachings of the Buddha are the most useful things to society. And in order to preserve those teachings, a monk must live by those teachings. And that's a full-time job in itself. And those teachings are valuable to the people, so that that a monk's job is preserving those teachings. Preserving the Buddha's teaching certainly seems a difficult full-time job, and human nature must at times rebel against it. Do monks not feel the hardships? I never got into a, a yearly routine or uh, getting a car or trying to find a house or anything like that. I was always just moving from flat to flat. And uh, I never really had a a feeling of having settled down at all, so I was still, I was still moving. And, uh, and in many ways, the monk's life is like that, is that you try and, and uh, live without any kind of dependence, without any kind of uh, attachment. When you first come here, it's very difficult because everything changes. There's the clothes. You change your clothes. You don't wear uh, trousers and shirt like you did before. Secondly, there's food. You change the type of food you eat, and you change the times you eat. Here, in the, forest mo in the forest monastery, we eat once a day. And that's different than the three times a day in between meal stacks, snacks. Secondly, or thirdly, there's the um, language. You have to learn a new language. And then there's your friends. All your friends are Thais now, and they're not, they're not Westerners. So the... There's the climate also. There's, there's many things that, that just involves a change and in, in adapting oneself to the, to the environment, to the people, to the language, to the food, to everything. And it's quite difficult at first. Well, I must, I mean, I can answer you uh, quite honestly that I still have, I still have, of course, thoughts and, and desires. Uh, so, and, and being, having had an interest earlier on in, in the fine arts, when, when life begins to get difficult here at times, of course you're, you want to escape, you want to uh, go back to the easy way and, and not uh, continue on. So I do have, I do have thoughts, but uh, I also have confidence in, in myself and, and what I'm trying to accomplish here. And uh, I feel that it's it's worth the effort to uh, keep myself here and, and continue. If I were a Buddhist monk, I think the greatest hardship would be the worry about health. When a monk leaves his cell of a morning to go on alms round, he's no idea what he will come back with or from whom the food will come. A native of Thailand has had a whole lifetime to build up immunity to local tropical diseases. The Westerner, trying to live like an Easterner, however, is easy prey. 
I might never have been to a forest monastery if I hadn't met Western forest monks down in Bangkok to receive treatment for serious illness. At Wat Nanachet, all the monks have had typhoid in some form or other. Hepatitis, malaria, and liver fluke are other frequent dangers, not to speak of the various forms of dysentery. Do they intend to maintain this asceticism for the rest of their lives? I'm too attached to the worldly life. I just want to be a time like one, two or three years here and practice meditation and uh, it gave me a, a foundation for the worldly life. I have no intention of uh, not going. I've, I have no intention of leaving, but I, I have no intention of, of, of staying forever either. It's, it's, uh, the progress is based on, whether I stay is based on the results I see. If I'm, if I'm seeing positive results, then, then it's uh, much more likely I'll continue. About an hour's walk from Wat Nanachat, there's another much larger forest monastery where the main community are Indo-Chinese, although there are a few foreigners as well. The most unusual of these is a French Trappist monk from Normandy who has spent 18 years in Japan and the last 18 months living as a Buddhist monk in Uban. How on earth does he reconcile his vocation as a Catholic Trappist monk with living in a Buddhist monastery? C'est la question classique que l'on pose et que posent quelquefois les bouddhistes. It's the classic question asked, the question Buddhists sometimes ask. In Japan, they don't ask it at all. Sometimes here in Thailand, they ask it, as do Christians also. I'll give you Zen's answer to it. If you think in concepts, if you think with your intellect, apparently there are contradictions in a priest living in a Buddhist monastery, but if you have a real experience, there are no contradictions. I can give you the version of a Zen master, Iyasotani. It's the man who has Mu. Mu is a Chinese word which is translated as nothing, but which really can't be translated as nothing. It's neither no, nor having, nor not having. Rather, it is seen experienced. Whoever sees this word, sees God. Chula Long Korn University, Bangkok. A group of monks have come to spend three days camping in the grounds, preaching the doctrine of the Lord Buddha to the students and being available for counsel and spiritual direction. The occasion was not a success. Only a handful of students attended and they looked rather mature. Maybe the fact was significant, or maybe it just meant that university students are a bit like each other all over the world. As I listened without comprehension to the preaching, I thought about some of the people I had met in Thailand over the past few weeks. Pra Utamo, the Trappist monk, and Tan Papakyao, the war veteran abbot, and people like Sean and Jeremy, smiling happily in their newfound sanctity. Over a short period of time, they had helped me to bridge the gap just a little between Eastern spirituality and my own Christianity. I believe that the perfection of God's revelation is in Jesus Christ, but I also believe that God reveals truth in various ways to all men. The monks in Chula Longhorn could probably never communicate with people like me, even if we shared the same language. Our cultural backgrounds are too far apart. So if there are riches to be exchanged between Buddhism and Christianity, it can only come about through people who immerse themselves completely in the other's religious culture, and then act as interpreters for the rest of us. In that context, the fact of Westerners from a Christian tradition living in Buddhist monasteries made a lot more sense. My parents don't go to church. Um, one can call them religious in a, in a strict sense of the word, but yet um, very moral people and they're very virtuous people. And, and I think if it wasn't for them, I wouldn't have the desire to 
to do what I'm doing at the present. Um, would you see yourself as a Christian Buddhist, or would you see yourself purely as a Buddhist? For me, Christianity is probably as alien as Buddhism is for most people in the West. Um, I've, I've only really come to any appreciation of Christianity since becoming um, strongly interested in Buddhism. Uh, I've, the words of Christ, are, obviously there's no, there can be no refutation, I think. Uh, I think most people who reject Christianity are rejecting much more the trappings and uh, the, the misunderstandings of, of Christ rather than the words of Christ. Um, Buddhism has very much a, a very direct application to, to everyday life in a way that people have trouble in finding in the way Christianity is presented uh, in the West. I mean. Right, we've cut it on that.